Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining this event today. Just a quick introduction. My name is Cheryl Downs and I'm the Deputy Chair of Women On Side as well as the co-founder of Beyond 90, which is a digital platform focusing on Australian women's football. Our Chair, Kerry Harris, was due to open the event today and she does send her apologies for not being available. Uh, beyond that, I'd certainly like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. I'm joining you from Jar Jar Wurrung country and I encourage you to add in the chat the lands on which you are joining this meeting today if you wish. Just a little bit about Women on Side as well. Hopefully a few of you already know what Women on Side do but just to give you a little bit more insight. So it, it's really about women in football everywhere and doing what we can to advocate for women to be involved in football, on the sidelines, on the field, in the administration, every single area. They focus on policy development, advocacy, professional development and networking, including special interest groups to achieve our goals. The professional development, and you'll probably hear more about that later on today, we have a number of different things that are run. On-site mentoring is an amazing thing that I've done myself, and we've got a new group of people going through that at the moment. We also have Getting On Board, which is a program that's run each year. And we also have the Women in Football Leadership Conference as well, which I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say when it is, but it's definitely in, in October. So get thinking about that. And I'm not sure if I can say where it is either, but hopefully we'll be able to share that. In terms of the special interest groups, we have special interest groups around coaching, governance, legal and integrity, media, supporters, and we also have state-based networks. So for example, Victoria, and we'd be looking to set up more as well. Um, and now let me introduce you to your host today, your real host, not me, I'm just doing opening remarks, but Kieran Pender. Kieran, welcome. Kieran is a Women On Side board member, as well as an award-winning lawyer and an award-winning writer and an academic. He comes very highly credentialed. He's also a senior lawyer with the Human Rights Law Centre, an honorary lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law, and is a consultant at Bradley Allen Love Lawyers. So he's, yeah, he's got a lot on his plate. I'm sure he's very busy, but very happy to have you, Kieran, running this event today. So welcome and thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for giving up some of your Wednesday evening, uh, wherever you are in Australia or New Zealand or elsewhere in the world. Uh, I also want to begin by acknowledging that I'm on uh, Ngunnawal land in Canberra tonight and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and to begin by acknowledging the excitement that uh, it's one year to go until the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup, um, which is why we've brought together such a distinguished panel. Um, their, their full bios uh, uh, were on when, when you registered, um, so I, I won't go into all that detail, but just briefly introduce um, firstly, Joe Fernandez, the head of uh, competition for Australia at the Women's World Cup. I first met Joe when uh, she made history uh, as one of the as, as the equal equal with one other that the first uh, women to be um, uh, host city coordinators at the 2018 Men's World Cup in Russia, uh, which I covered for the Guardian, and, and Joe and I have been in touch ever since. Um, uh, Brody Wales, co-founder of Matilda's Active Support. Fantastic to get the, the fan perspective tonight. Um, Samantha Lewis, uh, a distinguished sports journalist at the ABC and, and former colleague of mine at The Guardian, a real loss to The Guardian when Sam joined uh, the ABC. But delighted that she's um, doing such amazing work covering uh, all sports and particularly uh, football. And Paula Hansen, who leads um, the Women's World Cup Legacy and Inclusion for New Zealand football. Uh, obviously, this is a, a Women's World Cup being hosted across Australia and New Zealand. And so although Women on Side is an Australian organisation, we're really excited to get some perspective um, uh, from New Zealand and really delighted, particularly Paula, I know it's two hours later over there, so particularly grateful um, that you are joining us. So thank you uh, to everyone. Um, uh, and my colleague Tanya is going to host the Q&A uh, so we're going to have about a uh, moderated discussion uh, until about 7 p.m. Uh, Australian time, or East Coast Australian time, I should say, if there's anyone from Perth. 
And then Tanya's going to moderate the Q&A. So get your questions in um, via the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, I know that for uh, Joe, it's been a busy day with official commitments. So I thought we'd kick off by asking Joe, it's one year to go. How are things shaping up? Um, how is today and, and what does the year ahead hold? Thanks, Karen, and, and thanks for having me here. And I'd like to acknowledge that I uh, live on Durrock country. Um, so, yeah, and thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, today it really hits home. Uh, we are now talking days, weeks and months as opposed to years to this massive, massive event. Um, it is one of the biggest uh, events on the planet. And in fact, it is the largest uh, event for women for in sport on the, on the planet so I'm not quite sure everybody realizes how big this is and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted here um, on my screen and and people out there that you know you're fans of the game but it would be great to be spreading that word to others who are not quite sure about it yet because for me I look at it and it's, it's such an exciting um tournament I, I don't know if any of you are old enough I'm clearly old enough to remember the Sydney Olympics and the buzz and and so on around the Sydney Olympics and and that's a memory that lasts with you forever and we want to um, create that buzz and that those memories for people who are going to be witnessing the Women's World Cup next year um, clearly for the spectators and fans in Australia and New Zealand but also for the spectators and fans around the globe so um, a year to go, uh, yeah, it's um, a little overwhelming, to be honest, because it is such a, a huge event to organise, but very exciting today with all of the activities. And I don't know if you saw them, but it started with Hamilton in the morning and there's been activities all through the host cities um, right across to Perth, so right across the breadth of the tournament. And um, the bridges on the, uh, the lights, sorry, on the Harbour Bridge are going to be lit, if, if not already, very soon by... Um, Secretary General. So it's been a really exciting day. Um, we will be ready. Yes, there is a lot to do, um, but we will be ready. And we're really um, looking forward to hosting and as many people as we can to all of the um, the stadiums and via every other mean around, around the world um, to watch this Women's World Cup and just see how fabulous these athletes are at this game. Um, and how engrossing and how exciting the game can be. Um, and yeah, so it's just, it's really, it's really exciting that we're just one year away now. Thanks so much, Joe. And just to follow up, at a practical level, what is the year ahead going into to a tail for you? What are the things that you'll be working on in the year ahead to ensure that, that it does all go smoothly? Um, so there's a quite a lot of, I mean, as you can imagine, there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, um, you know, organising an event like this. There's a lot of operational areas right across the business. You know, we have um, my department is the competition department and we look after teams as well as making sure that the, the matches are delivered and looking after all the competition components as well as medical um, training sites, making sure the training sites are all um, prepared and, and up to standard for an international event. Um, but right across the business, there's a lot of other departments. We have a, a project management team. Clearly, there's some fundamental parts of any business, you know, our finance department, HR and so on, our services department. So they're integral to helping uh, the teams be happy as well, organising all the travel and the hotels um, for all of the teams. We have our operations department and within that are all the stadiums and of course the stadiums will be the focus for on on every match day um there's just so many areas you know i could talk for hours um but there's a few key milestones before we kick off on the 20th of july next year um, and one of those is that everybody knows about is the official draw um, and that's being held in auckland on the 22nd of october this year now, as part of that draw, we also, from my team, we um, hold a team seminar. So we provide some information to all of the participating teams, and then they will go out and have some venue inspections after the draw and the seminar. So they will be traveling around to um, training sites and hotels to have a look at those um, in preparation for next year. Uh, another mile, big milestone is the playoff tournament in February next year, and that has also been announced 
Um, and a number of teams have actually qualified already for the playoff tournament. It's a 10 team tournament and they will just, that tournament will decide the final three qualifiers for the tournament. So uh, for the, for the main tournament. Um, so they're two really large milestones. And of course, then there is the tournament itself. Teams as part of the regulations, they have to arrive into their team-based camps. And I think everyone is aware that this is the first time that the Women's World Cup uh, is using a team-based camp model. Teams have to arrive at least five days before their first match. Now, given how far down under we are, we expect teams probably to arrive a little earlier than that. Um, but that is the latest time that they're allowed to arrive and, of course, then, um, you know, start training in their team base camps and start preparing for the matches. Um, so, yeah, even just from my department, there is a lot to do. But right across the organisation, you know, in our communications department and we have safety and security and broadcast and media operations. I mean, we have um, there's a lot of areas um, that go into organising such a major event. Like this and I'm sure I might get some questions later on Tanya um, a little bit about behind the scenes and I'd be happy to answer those. Great thanks Joe. a lot to do and, and couldn't be in safer hands delighted you're leading that work. Come now to, to Paula and you. um, you're leading New Zealand football's work on ensuring it's a, an inclusive Women's World Cup and it's a Women's World Cup that leads a positive legacy an enduring legacy. Uh, how is that work going? What has that involved so far? And, and what are the plans, particularly around the legacy piece? Sure. Thanks, Kieran. Kia ora, everyone. Ko Hanson Taku Whanau, ko Paula Aho. So that's just a, a simple introduction in Te Reo Māori, which is our Indigenous uh, people here in Aotearoa. Um, yeah, so our, our legacy plan uh, is called Aotearoa United Legacy Starts Now, and it really is our um, blueprint for the next four or five years in the girls' and women's space especially. Um, but we recognise that uh, boys and men are often our biggest allies, so uh, they're coming along the journey uh, with us. Uh, we, we are really focused um, in recognising the absolute importance um, and once in a lifetime op opportunity to co-host uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 with our uh, friends across the Tasman. Um, but we also uh, recognise that the tournament will come in 2023 and the tournament will go. And so like, um, you know, uh, Football Australia, New Zealand football is really focused on how do we leverage that incredible opportunity to make sure that our participation numbers across all aspects of the game. Uh, so similar to um, what was mentioned just before, you know, our officials, our coaches, our players, our, our future leaders and administrators, um, we want to provide those opportunities and, and get really deep into our more diverse communities. Um, and that's where we see uh, significant uh, benefit to leverage the tournament. Um, but it's not rocket science, right? It's also the right thing to do. Uh, we want everybody to be loving football. Uh, we want every school or, or kura um, to know what football is, to, to have teams to get out and about, whether that's uh, non-traditional forms of the game. Uh, we want wahini or, or women to get involved in leadership um, opportunities and positions so that our game here in New Zealand, and um, when we look at... Uh, the coaches, the players, the administrators, that they are reflective of our communities here. Um, so there's a wee way to go, but um, we're really focused on um, leveraging this once-in-a-lifetime event to really showcase uh, what football um, can do for social change and, and the sustainable future for us all. So, uh, yeah, we're super excited. Um, I've actually... Uh, I live in Tamaki Makoto, which is Auckland, but today... Uh, I was up at 3 a.m. New Zealand time. Um, thankful we only have one time zone here um, and travelled down to Kirikiriroa or Hamilton for the dawn light ceremony uh, with local iwi at Waikato Stadium. Um, and a really humbling, moving uh, experience for us all. But, um, you know, as Joe mentioned, uh, a year ago, what what a significant day. And we've I've actually just run around the door to where I'm staying because we had a, a football festival um, and we talk about a tournament of firsts. So um, for the first time in my uh, football career, uh, I refereed junior football 
Uh, so that's uh, I'm going to tag that down as a legacy impact as well. So um, yeah, it, it's it's great. It's exciting for the tournament, um, but incredibly life changing for our our countries um, well past the tournament. I uh, now I feel even worse that we've kept you up so late. If you're up <laughs> uh, at three a.m. and you were refereeing as well, did you, did you give out any red cards? No, no, and, and, and the coaches and parents were, were pretty good. So obviously the messaging around um, sideline behaviour is getting through. So that, that was awesome. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. We'll come now to, to Sam. Um, and in the Q&A, there's already been a bit of scarf envy. Um, people asking uh, how they can get their hands on, on your uh, uh, 2023 tournament scarf. Um, and uh, given I'm in Canberra, it's very cold. I equally have some scarf envy. Um, Sam, from a media perspective, how do you think things are shaping up? And I guess, obviously, um, this is a, a group for me, most people attending, of, of the converted, of people who will, who have our following, of people who uh, uh, will go to games, will, will get tickets as soon as they're available. But where do you think things are shaping up? And do you think, I guess, to be a bit provocative, should there be more buzz in the media about the tournament with one year to go? Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Kieran. Hi, everyone. Hi from Darawal Country in southwestern Sydney. Uh, to the scarf question, you have to nick it. No, just kidding. You don't steal it. Don't steal anything. That's 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 bad juju. Um, no, I've been on the hunt for this scarf literally since I saw it as part of the launch. So I, the fact that I have it now is sort of a blessing. Um, yeah. So to the actual question, the purpose of me being on this Zoom, um, the the media coverage uh, so far, I think, has been quite patchy. Um, but I think that's for a couple of reasons. The first is just by virtue of the time. You know, we are a year out. And because of that, a lot of the work that is being done behind the scenes, as Joe sort of alluded to, is it's not visible. It's not really stuff that fans and supporters and even casual football people can really sort of hook their their claws into and to get really excited and the small things that are announced they're sort of quite rare they happen once every couple of months and so you tend to see sort of a bit of hype and media coverage around those kinds of pockets of moments but sustained media coverage and sort of a slow build has not really been there so far but I will qualify that by saying that now that we are only 365 days to go I do think things are going to improve because we're going to start to see more announcements from the World Cup team, we're going to start to see, you know, more games. We're going to start to see more initiatives from fan groups, which I'm sure Brody will will speak to as well as part of Matilda's active. We're going to see hopefully some more storytelling. Um, and we're hopefully going to see more fans really starting to, to get on board and to talk about things and to start to actually make plans to travel around the country once they know what the draw is, once they know the kinds of cities they want to go to, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think that's you know, because football is an ecosystem, right? And so all of these pieces have to sort of fall into place around each other for the whole to to start to really buzz with excitement. Um, so I, I don't think we're necessarily in a bad spot in terms of media coverage in that sense. Um, but I think we are in a bad spot just in the sense that football media generally in Australia is quite minimal. Um, and we... This is no mystery to anybody on this call, I'm sure. We're a nation dominated by other codes when it comes to mainstream media coverage, particularly Aussie rules and the NRL uh, and cricket to some extent as well. Football has always really struggled, I think, to crack that mainstream media kind of barrier. But the really fabulous thing about this Women's World Cup is that it really is a generational opportunity to really shatter that barrier and to get mainstream media to seriously see what football is. The fact that it's the biggest participation sport in the country, the fact that we are going to have this massive influx, not only of more participants, but also of investment, more, more players, you know, just everything that we've ever wanted in football is going to happen by virtue of hosting this tournament. And and that's hopefully what is going to be the biggest kind of legacy in terms of media and, and content and communication. It's that these flashes in the pan that it's felt like we've had over the past couple of years is going to be a sustained boil after this tournament is done. It's going to be something that hangs around, that stays around, and that continues to build as the game continues to blossom. Exciting times. We'll come back to that piece around legacy and particularly the media. But to, to come next to, to Brody, 
uh, as, as mentioned, co-founder of Matilda's Active Support. Brody, from a fan perspective, you know, what's the feeling? How are things shaping up? And, and what, what, what are Matilda's Active's plans for the tournament at this stage? Yeah, I, I, I kind of picked up a little bit on something that Sam was talking about then when I was thinking about this question a bit earlier. Um, it, today has been exciting and, you know, last week the Matilda's Active crew, we had our regular monthly catch-up and started to, like, really plan out what it is that we're going to do. And so that kind of helped build the excitement a little bit. I remember when we, when we won the hosting rights, you know, we were all on a Zoom call together and I, like, I started crying. I didn't even think that I was that invested in it, but, and then couldn't stop crying all day and every, even thinking about it. So, you know, we, we hit the ground running when that happened as Matilda's Active. We'd already prepared, you know, a welcome video to welcome other fans to Australia and New Zealand. Um, and, you know, we were really raring and keen to go. And then, you know, that, that C word that none of us wants to ever talk about anymore. I think that took a little bit of wind out of the sails because the team weren't playing here. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still a bit of a baby fan community. Like we were born in France and there hasn't been that many opportunities for, you know, our team to play on home soil. You know, we were hoping to go to India for the Asian Cup and then that became a spectator free tournament. So in terms of kind of building some of that fan momentum, I think we lost, like the wind did come out of the sails a little bit kind of there. So. You know, we've always, Matilda's Active has always, from the moment that we thought that this was a possibility that we would be hosting the world and, you know, our beautiful, you know, women's football community, we have always been focused on kind of two things. And that is that making sure that, you know, real fans of the women's game get to have that kind of amazing tournament experience. So we will be doing, of course, our pre-game meetups, We've got some great ideas uh, for kind of fan pubs in each host city. And, you know, we'll be looking for pubs to commit to showing the entire tournament so that we can tell fans from other countries that this is where you go and if you pop in there. Um, and, you know, I know we're going to talk a little bit about what happened in France later, so I won't go too much into it. But the real spirit that we took out of France was just bringing people together and, you know, we for France had planned pregame pubs and then people were just turning up at all times to those pubs. And that's what we want to try and recreate. And home soil does make that a little bit more difficult because, you know, how many home fans are taking the month off work? Are they working and then coming to games? You know, how do we kind of keep that spirit of being a travelling group of fans? So we'll be focusing quite a lot on that. And then we're also really wanting to be kind of the support mechanism in an, you know, there'll, there'll be all those official channels where you get your information. But one of the great things that, that we learned from our experience in France was working with other fans to get information and share information and, you know, organize meetups. So, you know, we really want to welcome the fans of the world. Like we want to be your buddies. We're going to be doing, you know, fun things to showcase both Australia and New Zealand and, you know, give the fans kind of that unofficial experience that, that makes travelling to a tournament great. So I think the excitement will start building now. We've got a couple of Matildas games coming up. So as long as we keep getting them here on home soil, then it will keep building. Fantastic. Thanks, Brody. And I might uh, stay with you. Obviously, the women's Euro is on at the moment and there's been some great clear fan interest um, seeing some of the images and speaking to people. Uh, I know there's a lot of excitement over there. Uh, what are you seeing and, and what lessons are, are you taking, if, if any, from the current tournament and the support and the engagement around that? I'm just feeling a lot of envy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing exactly what I saw in France. And I think one of the really kind of unique things about women's football is that really bitter rivalry that, that kind of spills over into nastiness doesn't really exist in our game. And so, you know, um, and I don't want to remind myself of this because I get that song stuck in my head, but, you know, the, the Dutch fans and their bus and that song that's worse than Rick Astley, um, you know, like you see that happening in the streets and, you know, I see, uh, you know, friends on social media who are over there and they're sharing that they've, 
you know, hanging out with the Swedish fans and the next day they're hanging out with Spanish fans and, you know, that's that's the stuff that we're going to try, I guess, and recreate. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how many fans do travel because, you know, somebody else mentioned it earlier, we, we are just that little bit further away. But, you know, we all manage to do it every tournament, so I think they can suck it up for one and, and come and join us. Thanks, Brody. If anyone on the call is not from Australia or New Zealand, uh, I definitely heed that call. Suck it up. It's a long flight, but it's going to be worth it. Um, Sam, I'll come back to you. Um, you talked a little bit about the, the legacy uh, for the media. Really keen if you can expand on what the tournament offers in terms of changing the media landscape in terms of both coverage of, of women's sport in Australia and New Zealand, and then also in terms of the, the makeup of the media, who are telling the stories, who gets these opportunities. And I think if I reflect having covered both the, the Men's World Cup in Russia and the Women's World Cup in France, the, the press cohort at both tournaments was overwhelmingly male. Now, it was improved, uh, I think, maybe 80%, 20% uh, or so um, in, in Russia, maybe more like 70%, 30% in France, but still uh, a press corps that, that was overwhelmingly male. I um, wonder if you can reflect on sort of the opportunities uh, presented by this tournament for, for changing that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's an astute observation and it's something that I've become increasingly aware of, I think, the the longer that I've worked in this space. Um I when I think back to 2019, it sort of feels like that was the tournament that proved that there is an appetite for women's football, but the way that mainstream media especially was structured didn't fully cater to that appetite from what I experienced anyway. And so I think 2023 is the tournament where we can really seriously cater for an appetite that we already know is there. It's almost like 2019 was sort of the test. It was like, how many people can we actually get watching this thing? And it turns out almost 2 billion people around the planet wanted to tune in and watch the Women's World Cup. So proof of concept, great. Now that we know that there's that, that many people who are keen to watch and keen to be part of this, how can we actually capture them and how can we keep them here? Not just for this singular month-long event, but how can we get them to stay? And I think that that is a big part of, of the Legacy 23 project that Football Australia and the Women's World Cup team are wanting to do is try and, and bring these perhaps more casual fans who have not, like they're not the kinds of people who are perhaps on this call. They're not al already the converted but they're people who are interested and they're people who want to give it a go. They're people who, you know, love Sam Kerr and they only ever watch Sam Kerr and that's great. And now they're going to come and watch a whole women's cup full of Sam Kerrs and they can take so much away from that and they can form a new love and a new team and a new community. And so media has to, I think, evolve structurally to ensure that those people aren't lost. Um, we're already sort of starting to see small moves being made in Australia. Uh, I noticed recently that Optus Sport have advertised for their first ever full-time women's football journalist, which is fantastic. I think it might be the only role of that kind in the country. In fact, I'm not technically a full-time women's football journalist, even though I try to push football as much as I can, but that would be the first. And that's, even though it is the first, it's the first, you know, like that's really exciting. Uh, something else that I've also noticed uh, over the last probably about six to eight months is that a lot of member federations are really starting to push content around women's football as well. So MPL level kinds of competitions, they're producing their own content, they're interviewing players, they're doing stuff that when I started to get involved with the women's game with Beyond 90, like we were basically the only ones doing that. We were the ones writing the match reports for women's games. We were the ones interviewing the players, but now it's actually clubs and federations themselves who are telling those stories. And that's so important because they have the resources to be able to do that. Whereas mainstream media, particularly when it comes to football coverage, as I mentioned before, is kind of lagging behind. And that's because of various cultural issues to do with Australia being multi-sport and all of that. So I think the, the biggest takeaway that I would like to see in terms of the legacy of, the, of 2023 is creating more serious 
sustainable full-time opportunities for people in women's football to tell stories, whether they're writers, whether they're social media creators, whether they uh, are videographers, photographers, whether they want it, just any kind of content that is able to tell a story whoop, and share uh, to, and be part of this sort of larger community that we've built up. I think that we need to have more opportunities for people to really pursue that full time because overwhelmingly media is in women's football is still largely freelance it's still largely volunteer and a part of me is actually hoping that when it comes to accreditations for next year there might be some flexibility in terms of allowing you know freelance and and volunteer and independent media organizations to be accredited for the women's world cup because up until I think ever you haven't been allowed to do that. That's probably why we've seen at major tournaments, mainstream media organizations, which are dominated by white men are the ones who get given the spots in the media box, because that's the way that accreditations have been structured. So being able to open that up and be more flexible and really cater to the actual landscape of women's football content and ensuring that the people who are dedicated to telling these stories and have been telling these stories for a long time really get an opportunity to be front and centre and be involved in shaping what is going to be a really important tournament for a lot of different people. I think that should be probably the primary legacy that it leaves in terms of media coverage. Couldn't agree more, Sam. Thanks for such a great answer. Some great questions coming through as well. Make sure you keep those coming. Um, we'll get to Q&A shortly. Paula, to continue on that discussion of legacy, what do you think success in terms of legacy would look like in, in a few years' time when we're looking back on this tournament? What, what are you hoping you'll see? Yeah, look, look just supporting what, what Sam said too, uh, you know, our, our mainstream media are, are showing some improvements and we have, uh, when the Ford Football Ferns are playing, we're now seeing uh, women commentators, which, which is a fantastic uh, initiative. Um, what what we would see success as though in anything around uh, women's football, uh, but also women in football, um, is that we're not piloting anything anymore. These aren't great new initiatives. That this is just the way it is. That women proudly coach national teams, and we have women commentators in in a multitude of languages. That uh, every girl and woman in every diverse community loves football, knows how to connect through to their club or their school, uh, through to our federation structure here, um, and that we're all celebrating and telling stories, um, not just on the international stage. Um, you know, I, I'm i learning in this role. I'm, I'm not. Uh, storytelling is in our DNA here, um, and we recognise and uh, are proud of our um, ancestors and our past and our, and our current and we look to the future and those three aspects are, are critical in, in kind of the way we we live here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so being able to bring that through into everybody telling their story, whether it's on their own social media channels or in, in the media or, you know, on, on webinars such as this, but actually starting to put ourselves out there as, you know, if the old saying, if you can see it, you can be it. And so we... We hold responsibility personally um, to be sharing our stories. We didn't all wake up uh, with the careers we have, all the roles we have, all the influence. And, and so a big part of our legacy here is um, getting the right, really good people um, to share their experiences, the good, the bad and the ugly, because it's it's not all unicorns and rainbows, right? Um, and, and just really knowing that after the tournament, you know, I, I want to see my granddaughter holding the mascot and and in 10 years' time when she's playing youth football, saying, this is what I got in 2023. This is what it means to me. And I, and I want our future girls um, and our, our future superstars across the game to remember where they were when we kicked off at Eden Park and where they were when, you know, the final happened in Sydney and really... Um, have that deep understanding of it, you know, this is an incredible moment in time. Um, but to do all that, we, we have to connect strongly and keep building our relationships across our own countries and, and our trans Tasman relations as well, because ultimately um, we want football to win and we want girls and women to have uh, equal opportunity. We want gender equality. Um, 
and and we want what's right um and so that's what we're we're really striving for and kind of our legacy approach fantastic joe you've been to uh, from what i can tell 17 world cups and olympics which is uh, an incredible number of amazing tournaments very envious uh, I, I have not been to 17, um, but this must be a particularly special uh, World Cup to be working on, on home soil. Can you reflect on how you found the experience being involved and, and, and what it means to uh, after your distinguished career all around the world to be doing it on home soil? You're on mute. Did you count those up for me, Kieran? I can't believe it is 17 anyway. But yes, uh, every event is unique, um, but certainly this one is the most special of all. Um, as soon as the, the bid was won, and I think like many of us up, up in the middle of the night and, and seeing that uh, Australia and New Zealand had won the bid was just such a, you know, euphoric moment. Um, and I guess, you know, working at a World Cup is a really intense period of time and when I've worked on World Cups previously I've been there for a period of say you know somewhere between four to six weeks and it's a really intense period and it's great teamwork with the team that you're working with in a particular venue um, so actually being employed two years out and now it's one year but I've been at this job now for uh, two years uh, another year being able to have that teamwork and I guess that camaraderie with a with a team and you know our, our our friends across the ditch as well. So in New Zealand and Australia, we're working very collaborative. I can't even say that word. It's too late. <laughs> Collaboratively um, is really special to be able to, to come together and, and work at home and know that the biggest women's sporting event on the planet is going to be played in our backyards and that, you know, this tournament can inspire not just girls and women, but boys and men. You know, it, this is a a sport that is available for everyone to be involved in, whether you're as a player or as a coach, as a referee, um, as an administrator. We certainly need more more women in senior leadership roles as well on boards and, you know, being directors and, and CEOs, clubs. You know, this this is a great opportunity for the game in Australia and New Zealand to really take a big leap forward. You know, we've taken a lot of steps over many years. Now this this will be a massive leap forward. Um, so, yeah, just working with a team, um, such a passionate team, like in the office, there's such a buzz and such a, I guess, there's such energy because everyone and, and some, some of you who've worked in football um, will understand why I'm saying this. Everyone is moving in the same direction. Everybody wants to deliver the you know the best women's world cup so far the best yet and so the energy around the office and the same in new zealand i'm sure is that we're all working towards the same goal and sometimes in sport it's not always this you know there's different there's conflicting uh, you know points of view and so on but um so that's it, it's a real um such a pleasure to go to work every day and be part of that energy as we all want to deliver the best women's world cup ever Thanks, Joe. Women on sides tagline is women in football everywhere, and uh, you, you can put it as, as as well as you just did. Um, Brody and Sam, you both went to the Women's World Cup in France in 2019, uh, as did I. It was a fantastic tournament. Just wondering if you could each reflect, maybe Brody first and then Sam, on, on what we can learn from what went right and what went wrong in in France, and and how we can sort of what we might expect um, in a year's time, Brody. Um, yeah, look, I know that a lot of people have thoughts about uh, what went wrong in France. Um, I, I speak a little bit of French and I spent some time living in Lyon, actually. So I was fully prepared for the laissez-faire. Um, and I know some of my friends weren't. Um, so some of the little things like fan experiences, and I know even in seeing social media comments leading up to this particular webinar, um, you know, that opening game, uh, in, in Paris with France versus South Korea, um, you know, just simple little things like this is an audience of women, but there were like mostly men on security and they weren't allowed to uh, pat down the women to make sure we weren't smuggling in anything. And so that led to really quite lengthy 
delays going into the stadium. Um, you know, I love Leon to death. Uh, it's my second home, but you know, the trams were a bit of a disaster. Um, you know, two different ticketing systems for the one tram. And, you know, I, I'm a, also like Joe, a little bit older and able to remember um, the Olympics and very lucky to have been super involved, um, you know, with volunteer roles and, and, and different things. So I don't, that won't, I can't see that being an issue. It's just not in either of our country's kind of ways of being. You know, when we, we do organise large events very well. I have travelled to New Zealand and, and been around um, when the Rugby World Cup was on, so that was something. Um, but, yeah, I I just, I just those kinds of things I know come up all the time. And I guess for me, I look back and I know the people in Matilda's Active look back on France really fondly because, um, you know, I've had a number of people say to me, so basically what happened is, we just started a Facebook community for people traveling independently to the tournament to come together. Uh, there are companies who do organize tours and things like that, but not everybody can afford to go on those. They are, they are pretty expensive. So we just wanted to create a space for people who were traveling independently to kind of come together and, and connect and meet up and share travel deals. And, you know, I'm going to go this day from this city who wants to meet up. And that's, for me, what we need to, you know, we need to replicate as a fan community from France is, you know, that when you're at that tournament, and, and I think that this did happen in France mostly because their cities are still quite compact um, outside of Paris. But that sense that when you're at the tournament, you're at a tournament. You're not at just a game, like, or an international or just a friendly. You're at a tournament. And from the second you arrive in the city that you're there to watch the game at, whether that's two days before or the morning of, that vibe is there, that, that you're at a tournament and everybody else is around and that everybody in the pubs are people who love what you love and you can have a conversation with kind of anybody. And, yeah, I mean, I'm things that I'm looking for, like I loved that the Matildas at that tournament had a jersey that was just the Matildas jersey. And I was a little bit sad when we went back to having the same as the men and so you know to be in a space where you're around thousands of people who are super committed to the women's side of our game you know I'm, I'm looking forward to well you know we're looking forward to creating more of that kind of stuff as well so I think that's really important to come through as well that this is a you know yes it is about football generally and I've been so encouraged hearing um, Paula speak and Joe speak but this is also like, this is about women, not only on the pitch, but women in our game. And I think that that's something that we as Matilda's Active will always fight for. Um, but yes, I think that was something that I took away from France. Like this is my community. I've, I found my space, I found my people. Thanks, Brody, Sam? Yeah, I'll bounce off that. That's, that's so interesting, Brody. I think that the biggest takeaway that I had from France was it almost, it felt in some cities like the fan didn't matter. It didn't feel like a fan centric football tournament. I remember going to some of the bigger cities, for example, and you could move through subway systems and not know that a women's world cup was happening at all. Cause there was just nothing. Whereas when you went to smaller cities like Valenciennes, for example, Montpellier, it, they really got behind it. There was advertising everywhere, uh, pubs, lots of pubs and restaurants had, you know, big TV screens turned out to the street so people walking past could watch games that were on telly. You know, everyone was really behind it in those kind of smaller cities that were hosting it. And But comp you know, compared with like a Paris, for example, or even really a Lyon uh, and a Nice as well, those were sort of the, the big cities where I was like, do they know? that this is on, you know, like I just, sometimes you'd be on the subway and you'd be sort of chugging along. And it's only when you got to the station where you had to get off for the game, would people like rip out their scarves and take off their jackets and you'd see that they had jerseys underneath. But other than those kinds of little moments, you had no idea that people really cared outside of these particular sort of tunnels and, and pockets of, of, of communities and fans. So I really hope that 2023 doesn't do that. I really hope that every host city really like 
that it's that they, they focus on the fan and the fan experience from the very moment that fans land at the airport or a train station to to get to these games that there's advertising everywhere there are engagement activities there are fan zones there's all the kind of stuff Brody that you were saying that so it feels like a tournament so it feels like something that's really special rather than something that sometimes you have to go looking for that's what I I'm I'm really hope happens um but I think as well, you know, 2019, it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a real reiteration that women's football has a very different kind of culture to it that than men's football does. And France, I think, didn't quite know how to cater to that in some ways. I think a lot of the fan zones were not very well organized. Some of them weren't even ready by the time the games actually rolled around. And maybe that is that laissez-faire sort of French attitude, but you know, that was really disappointing because it could have been so great. It could have been so magical, especially for a lot of the younger fans and the, and the traveling fans who were going there, who wanted to get a sense of the culture that they were going into in France, but also a sense of the women's football culture in that country as well. And I think we've got a really unique women's football culture here in Australia. We're incredibly open, we're inclusive, we're diverse, we're really fun, you know, like I, I want that the spirit of women's football fan culture to be really embedded in all of the activities that we have available for traveling fans so that they can not only have a really great time at the tournament, but they also understand who we are as a community. And I'd love us to, you know, incorporate stories around our own women's football history, having some of our pioneer players, you know, being part of some fan engagement activities, making sure that People know that, you know, when a game kicks off in Brisbane, that this was where the first ever recorded women's football game in Australia occurred all the way back in the 1920s. Like, I'd love for all of those stories to be woven throughout the whole experience for traveling fans so that they can really appreciate who we are as a nation, particularly in terms of our First Nations communities and the big multicultural pockets of fans that we've got here as well. Because it's the other really unique opportunity we've got about hosting this tournament. Australia in particular is one of the most multicultural nations on earth. So really engaging with all of the different cultural communities that we've got, all of whom are going to have a team to support at this Women's World Cup, being able to really bring them into the fan experience as well, get them to inform us how they want to engage with their traveling fans. What can we do to bring all of these different people together and to really celebrate who we are as a country? Because like, it's a cliche, but football is the world game. And Australia, I think, is the best representation of that. I think that's a great note to hand over to Q&A. Um, over to you, Tanya. Thank you, uh, everyone that has asked questions. Uh, well, there's one comment say, asking about, well, comment and question where they can get the scarves. Are they on sale and where they can uh, uh, find them? So this is a Matilda's Active scarf. So Brody is your person to speak to for to all Matilda's Active gear, including this incredible T-shirt. <laughs> Choose your player with Matilda's Legends on the front, also <laughs> Matilda's Active. Um, but this is unfortunately not for sale, the Women's World Cup one yet. I don't know if it ever will be on sale, but I, I was gifted it because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be, uh, to know some people in the biz. So yeah, unfortunately <laughs> that's not available. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tara and Jason ask a same, similar question. Which Australian media network have already locked in coverage or expressed interest for the World Cup and will the majority be free to air, such as the such as the BBC covering uh, for the Women's Euro? Yeah, it sounds like a me a V question, isn't it? Um, or oh, oh, Joe, do you are you, are you up to date uh, with this? Uh, over over to you, Sam. Okay, you, you work in the media business. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the uh, pay TV broadcaster is going to be Optus Sport. They've got the, the rights for the entire tournament. They haven't yet uh, finalised who's going to be the free-to-air broadcaster, but there will be a free-to-air broadcaster um, at one of the other networks. There it could be a, a, a many. There are lots of different networks on the table, including uh, SBS, who are hosting the men's. They're broadcasting the Men's World Cup in Qatar in November. 
Um, but also Channel 10. We've seen Channel 10 come to the table as the, the broadcast partner of the Australian Professional Leagues and the national teams as well. So that seems like it would be a good fit. Um, but one of the, I think, uh, tricky negotiation things at the moment is that Channel 10 has its own um, streaming platform, which is technically a rival of Optus Sport. And so how they're going to negotiate that is going to be a little bit tough. Um, but you would hope that Optus, uh, they have the best interests of the, the tournament and women's football in mind. And so they're going to want to partner with a public broadcaster who has incredible reach and who has the expertise and who is going to take this tournament seriously and is going to really invest in giving it as much exposure and as professional and quality broadcasting exposure as possible. So hopefully we'll get an announcement sometime in the next probably four to six months about who they're going to be partnering with. Excellent. Thank you. Um, no question. Do we have any physical material that clubs can use to advertise their tournament that can be shown at grounds? Uh, maybe Joe and Paula. Yeah, um, from, from our side, I think all of that is in development. Um, as you can appreciate, the, the brand was just launched uh, not that many months ago. Um, with the, and, and so there's clearly a lot of work and a lot of um, um, development of all of those assets and so on. And so that's in the domain of our marketing and, and brand management areas. So at this point in time, I don't believe we have anything, but I'm sure that there will be something as we move towards the tournament and um, that information will, you know, will be, will be distributed out through, I think, Football Australia and the member federations and through clubs. But um, I don't have the direct answer for that, but I'm sure that there will be some some products um, as we move towards the tournament. Great, thank you. Paula? Paula, Paula might be able to answer from uh, New Zealand. Yeah. Yes, certainly that is what we, our understanding is and what we would expecting to is a kind of brand marketing type package that would be available for uh, clubs, um, you know, final trading sites, uh, host cities have their packages uh, in, the, in the mainstream at the moment. Um, so yeah, it, as Joe said, a development Part of the challenge, right, is as we are now one year to go, the excitement's building. And, you know, when I was at the stadium today, clubs are asking me, when can we have this information? We want to promote it. We want to do all these super cool things. Um, so the excitement's definitely there. Now we've got to kind of get the material um, done well and, and out to everybody who wants, wants that uh, when it's ready. Excellent. Thank you, Paula. And I think this one will be for Brody. Uh, is there any plans for international funds that they will travel for the competition? Ticket plus accommodation plus visa packages. Uh, is there anything that you uh, foresee? It's gonna happen? Um, well, I'm sure there will be, but Matilda's Active is not, we're not a travel company um, and we don't ever aspire to be, to be honest with you. We are um, we're a fan community, we're a space for, um, you know, genuine fan kind of connection. Um, you know, we're happy to support other fan groups who might want to be providing information for their particular members. And, you know, we, we're starting to reach out to fan groups with that in mind. But no, we don't. There, 100% there will be com companies who will do that, like, it's yeah. a way to make money. Somebody will do it. It's capitalism, whether you like it or not. Um, but sorry, socialist. Um, but yeah, it's not something that Matilda's active. Okay. Does. But if you have questions about traveling in Australia, get in touch. <laughs> uh, uh, if I could just dive in there with regards to tickets, the tickets will start to go on sale in October. Um, and clearly the, the ticket sales after the draw. So after the 22nd of October, when it is clear which teams are going to be playing in which city and which location, then clearly the ticket sales and all of the um, packages and so on around that will, will ramp up from that moment. So there's a lot of preparation work going on at the moment um, for that on-sale period. Um, but clearly once the draw has been completed on the 22nd of October, that is when all the ticketing arrangements will be ramped up. 
Great, thank you. Thanks, very important information. Um, and I think, sorry, just just as an aside to that too, I think there was a question in there about the draw and the match times and so on. That all comes out at the draw on the 22nd of October. So um, yes, there is a match schedule. You can go on to the FIFA Women's World Cup site and you can see the match schedule with the match numbers. Um, but at the moment, there is no team names, clearly. Um, and when the draw, when the balls come out of the pot in October, then that will, the, the name, the team names and the match times will be populated into that match schedule and that will be available. Um, it should be available on the 23rd of October, the day after, the day after the draw itself. Perfect. Thank you. Question for Paula. Is there a, from Heather, it's there any equivalent fan support group uh, to Matilda's Active for the firms in New Zealand? Yeah, great question. Uh, here in New Zealand, we have Friends of Football, uh, who um, run a number of community events and also run the, the connection and engagement um, with fans, but also with um, past ferns as well. Uh, it's it's definitely an area that, uh, from a New Zealand football MA uh, perspective, you know, fans are so critical to us in the game anyway, um, and obviously as well for the tournament. So rather than New Zealand football create a, a new fan base or a new uh kind of focus we're really invested in partnering with those organizations and the people that are, are doing incredible mahi or work in, the, in their space already so um we are though with the new zealand football looking at some events that we can look to run uh, before you know the draw the playoff tournament and the festival itself uh, for our fans and our, our past ferns and our past uh, men's national players and futsal as well so um, we're getting there, but Friends of Football would be the place I'd, I'd go and Google. Great, thank you. Um, question from Can Helen. I just jump in there quickly too? Um, yeah. Because Matilda's Active have long been on the hunt for uh, football ferns, fans at a kind of grassroots level that we can connect with. And I saw a comment from Holly, um, who is involved in Little Yellow Corner, I hope I said that right, Holly, uh, who support the, the Nooks in the W League. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, Holly, I'm sure, would love to, to be involved too. Um, they very kindly came and met with us and gave us a nice little memento at the game here in Canberra against New Zealand. So, Thanks. Okay, so and then question from Deborah. When can we start accessing the merchandise? to advocate uh, of the tournament? That, that's the same answer as for the um, items for clubs and so on. So that, that is all in development at the moment. Um, and I can't give you a time frame that, that's run by our marketing and brand and so on departments, um, but you can be assured there will be merchandise as we move closer to the tournament. Excellent, thank you. A uh, question from Alex. Uh, what is being planned in terms of the upcoming A-League women's season in the lead up to the World Cup? I believe it's a great opportunity to grow the game, promote our domestic league and keep the momentum going for the World Cup as well as in the years afterwards. I think our grassroots and PL clubs can offer a lot as well in terms of a local touch by talking about um, how their players are now Matildas. This will be inspiring for the next generation. Maybe I can speak to that. Um, yeah, I, I think the the upcoming A-League women's season is critical for the Women's World Cup because it is the highest profile domestic women's league that we've got in Australia. It's going to feature a couple of players who are, well, a number of players who are potentially going to be in those squads come 2023. And it's also going to be the place that traveling fans are going to look to, uh, to, to see what they can expect when they get here. You know, this is going to be the last uh, league broadcast around the world where people are going to get a sense of, of what, what's to come. So I think the APL who run the A-League Women's have a, a really big responsibility this year to make this season as good and as exciting and as smooth as possible. 
Uh, the their recent season in terms of their media coverage at least has been a little bit bumpy and that is of course largely due to COVID and a lot of the games having to to change schedules and and things like that um, but also in terms of you know their fan engagement strategies their content on keep up I still don't personally I really understand what that website is about or who it's targeting or what the what the market is there but you know, I think that last season was a, a bit of an ironing out period, them unbundling from Football Australia, finally getting the keys to the car in their terms um, and seeing what's under the hood. And so now that they've got much clearer air in terms of COVID, they have more predictability. They are settled with their new broadcaster in Channel 10. They have a longer A-League women's season. They have a new club in Western United. They have a Women's World Cup around the corner. They've got a number of young Matildas and football ferns who are going to be using this competition to put their hands up for those squads in 2023. I think this is a really important springboard in order to create some serious energy and some serious hype for next year because this is ultimately the league that we want to be transformed into a fully professional full-time women's competition. And today uh, at the, the the event in Sydney, actually, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing FIFA legend Carla Overbeck, who was part of the 99ers. She was the captain of the US Women's, women's National Team when they won the Women's World Cup in 1999 on home soil. And I asked her what the legacy was of hosting that tournament in the USA and she said that within a year, they'd launched a whole new women's competition. She said that grassroots participation absolutely boomed. She said it was so critical for US women's soccer to go to the next level to be hosting this tournament. So, you know, as I said at the very start of this call, football is an ecosystem. We need to have all of the different parts working in unison in order to make this the best possible thing poss that, that it can be. And the APL has a really important role to play in that larger conversation, particularly in the next 12 months. Great. Thanks. Can I just jump in, sorry, Tanya, around the, the A-League? And, you know, it, it's uh, a year in for the, the Wellington Phoenix team at New Zealand's first professional women's football team, uh, sits proudly within legacy starts now. Um, but to, to have that step now for our up and coming uh, Kiwi youngsters, um, you know, it, it's just such an incredible opportunity. And we're seeing in, in recent games with the Ford Football Ferns, some of those players coming out of the A-League environment, uh, having been uh, professional for a season um, where their development has clearly, uh, you know, improved um, and wouldn't have um, been able to had there not been that the Wellington Phoenix team entering the league uh, last season. So we're, we're incredibly proud and super excited, especially for the young team. Uh, but I guess from a uh, selfish perspective, what we are really looking forward to this season is having them at home, uh, not just Wellington Phoenix, but our four football ferns at home as well. Um, and so that that all, all, all you uh, Australians can come over, watch the Wellington Phoenix and experience what we we have here. We just haven't been able to showcase it thanks to COVID. So, but I think you're right, Sam, that the next um, A-League season, absolutely critical, not just for media and exposure, but actually the focus towards both our nations want to, you know, be performing at our highest level come July 2023 and, you know, that, that's an incredible league to provide that platform. Thank you. So I think we're running out of time and uh, just a few remaining questions. Um, Kieran, over to you. I just wanted to thank everyone. Thanks to everyone who joined us tonight um, or today, wherever you are in the world. Really appreciated the great discussion and the great questions that came in. Thanks to our uh, fantastic panel. That was a really energizing discussion. I'm excited, 365 days to go. Um, and uh, particular, um, well, again, thanks to all the, all the panelists who I know have all had busy days, um, particularly Paula who got up so early, Joe, I know it's been a busy day for you um, with the one year to go celebration. Uh, so really appreciate it. Um, if you're not already a member of Women On Side, um, encourage you to join. Um, and, and there's a, a QR code there on the screen, you can, you can join. We do a whole range of great initiatives that ultimately are about women in football everywhere um, and, and improving uh, the game for women. We've got some more webinars coming up. We've got our, our conference later in the year. 
and really excited for a huge year next year with the Women's World Cup on home soil. So thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.